Um, <clears throat> uh, it's really a privilege to be here today, for one thing with the Mockers, but also with you guys. You've been our supporting church for a long time now. And if I had to give this little session um, a title, I would call it Dreams, Prayers, and Lavender. And that sounds really romantic, I know, but it's truly a patchwork of ideas. Oh, if you take notes, you might as well give up. This is such a, a hodgepodge. You can maybe get a little out of it, but certainly not worthy of taking notes. But um, I know that it really, I had so many things I wanted to share that I couldn't decide on a theme. So I thought, well, at least I can tell you a little bit what I, about what I'd like to speak on. And the first thing I mentioned was prayer. And that is because I want to thank you for years. You guys have prayed for us, and I think prayer is the work. There's a lot of fun things about doing missions. You get to visit people. You get to be involved in ministry in different ways, and later you'll see some of the things the Lord has let us do. But to me, just to stop and pray, that's the harder part. So you've done the hard work, and, we, and that has worked in our lives. And what might seem unseen to you is very visible on the mission field to see the fruit of your prayers. So thank you so much. And um, if I start with prayers of my own life, some of that will tie you to dreams too, when I use the word dreams. And um, my story sort of starts in the top of a tree. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of my testimony instead of updating you on what we've done in the last <clears throat> little bit on the mission field, I wanna tell you more of my personal testimony because um, I think of the verse that speaks to me um, in 1 Samuel, it says, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully or consider what great things he has done for you. And I think each of us could get up here and say, well, this is what the Lord's done for me. But I thought that's what I'll do a little bit more, just my testimony rather than an update. And um, that means I do want to start at the top of that tree because that's where I remember praying. I, I, I love to pray and outdoors. I still do that. I pray when I'm walking or running. And when I was maybe seven or eight, I don't remember the age, I, I had a favorite spot to pray in the top of a poplar tree. And I remember from the top, top branches of that tree praying and thinking, well, Lord, if you've done so much for me, what could I do for you? And it just came to my mind, well, I'd want to be a missionary. And um, it became a little agreement between the Lord and I that I felt like he heard that prayer. And I don't know why I didn't tell my mother, but I told my grandmother, and she said, that's a really good idea. And the interesting thing is, I didn't, in the churches that I grew up in, I never met a missionary, so I didn't really have a role model. I didn't, at that point, I hadn't read about missionaries. I just thought that's what I would want to do. And um, so I kept this idea in my heart, and it's like a little, this was not a very crystal clear dream, and dreams are sort of like that, but somehow in my heart, I just felt like I would go to Africa one day, and I dreamt in my mind of deserts and camels, and I thought, wow, I don't even think I'm going to like it, but I think I'm going there, and then I remember praying, Lord, could you send me to a place with mountains instead? Is there a place like that in Africa? I ended up in a place like that. Um, so, um, I, I also had a verse that has followed me, followed me, followed me, and it is, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And I felt like it's a two-way thing. I think the Lord put the desire to do missions in my heart, and then it got the sense of grant that desire, and he will grant the desires of your heart. And I thought, okay, he will have to bring it to pass. And so I kept that as a little promise between the Lord and I, because I really communicate with the Lord as of a best friend. I don't mean to say that um, without reverence, but I constantly communicate with him outdoors, indoors, or just, you know, in a store to help me make a wise decision, etc. So I felt like this was an agreement between the Lord and I that he put the desire to be a missionary in my heart and that he would help me to accomplish that. Then I got to work at my father who was an oral surgeon and I worked in his office. And at first I worked up front doing filing and things and I was terrible at it. I hated it. And if he had that was when you put files in a file cabinet alphabetically and I'd have to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I, I could I mean I did it so laboriously and disliked it. And then he let me work in the back with the patients and it just opened my eyes to the wonder of medicine to me that 
It's fascinating. And I just, I, my dad, I remember several times would remind me, don't ask so many questions because patients are not asleep. Because I said, oh, how are you going to close that hole? You know, so I literally asked him that one time. And he glared at me over his glasses. But um, he closed the hole, but I, I remember that vividly. And so then I thought, Lord, if you'll let me, I'd like to be a medical missionary as well. And so that got added to my request to the Lord and the little agreement between us. So I had a little calendar with the verse, delight thyself also in the Lord, he shall give you the desires of thy heart. And I went to Clemson, I never went to a Christian school in my life. <clears throat> I went to Clemson University and I put that verse right beside my bed and I said, look Lord, let's just remind each other <laughs> of this agreement that is gonna help me get to medical school. And it, it really did reassure me at times when I felt discouraged. And um, I did get into medical school by the Lord's grace. I could tell you the story of how the Lord did that amazingly, but he did. And then I um, went to Charlotte to do my residency in OBGYN after I did medical school in Charleston. And each step of the way, I could tell you amazing stories about how the Lord definitely sustained me. And during this time, I fueled my desires of being a missionary by reading missionary biography and I would suggest any of you all to read Christian books or Christian biography that's really like such a nourishment to your soul and I remember my grandmother the same one that I told you who was encouraging me about being a missionary she said reading a book is like making a friend and it's hard to close the cover and you know I made a lot of friends in Africa just by reading books out there and that kept me company too so I suggest that. But when I read, um, I always read medical books about doctors who would um, ford streams, go through the jungle, operate on their kitchen table. And one of my favorite stories was a doctor who had to sew up a laceration and didn't have suture and use the tail of a horse. And I just thought that is the coolest thing. That is me. One day I'll be doing things like that. And so... This was in, you know, this isn't. This was my dream at the time. So I'll talk to you about this idea. I just really felt like this is what would happen, and I was so eager to to do that. And I even did a course in tropical disease in Canada to learn about all the tropical diseases I would treat. And I was real. I was excited. But by the time I got to Africa, I, I can't tell you all the stories. So we'd be here as long as I've been alive. But. <laughs> Uh, during this time, gradually the Lord led me to my husband, and we got married a little later. I was 28, and then by the time we went to Africa, we had three children, and the youngest was barely walking. She was like 15 months. So that that was a lot different than me being on horseback riding through the rivers, and so my dreams sort of changed a little bit, and it <clears throat> became keep my children alive. <laughs> and, um, so... That was different to figure out, okay, how do I use medicine? And I have a family. And um, the Lord changed my path in ways I didn't expect because I thought I'd be working in a hospital. And instead, we went to a seminary and we built a clinic that didn't exist. And I found myself being the director of that clinic. And anyone who knows me well will tell you, honestly, I'm not an administrator. And I really hate to tell people what to do. I'm not a great director. I just like medicine. But um, that was very different to, to direct uh, a clinic and to see just general medicine. And it shook my confidence a bit because I had studied OBGYN. And plus, I felt very out of my element. And I remember talking to a veteran missionary. They had done missions in Africa for 40 years, the drive box. I think you might know him. And um, I thought that, I said, I really feel like I'm not quite prepared for this. I'm afraid I'm missing things. I, when I look at these slides, I'm not sure if it's malaria. And kind of lamenting that I could be inadequate to this task. And Mrs. Dreisbach, who was a nurse, she was totally unsympathetic. And she just told me, she says, well, how did she put it? I gotta remember it now. Um, you're better than nothing, and nothing's all they got. And that's all she said, you're better than nothing, and nothing's all they got. <laughs> and so I thought that really helped me, because I thought, well, I am a little better than nothing here, because that is, I'm the only thing they have. And so that, that gave me encouragement. And um, so 
I, I felt like, okay, I'll take this dream of doing OBGYN, which I had studied in this African setting, and I'll just put it away in a, in a box. And this is a kind of a story within a story, but during one of my furloughs, uh, the hospital, the little hospital at Bob Jones was shutting down, and they called me and they said, oh, we have these beautiful instruments. Would you like to have some instruments? And they, I said, sure, I can take them with me and um, use them hopefully in Africa. So they gave me this box that was labeled hysterectomy. And it was those instruments, you can't imagine how much they cost. And so I took my box, it, it was a cardboard box of hysterectomy instruments back to Africa. And um, everywhere we moved, we moved three times, I would move that box. And it kind of, haunted me frankly because I looked at that box and thought that's what I thought I would do in my dreams and instead it's sitting on a shelf somewhere and it and as it would move with me I would just almost feel plagued by it because I thought I'll never use this and nor will I remember how to use them by the time maybe I should so it went to three different places and it, shelf 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 <clears throat> and like my dreams I felt shelf 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 so finally I felt so badly about this instrument so I thought I shouldn't keep these so I gave them away to a hospital in Africa in the mountains a beautiful mountainous hospital that was a mission hospital and said these ought to be used so I gave them to him and then um, the Lord led me in different ways and allowed me to follow him rather than him following me and I, I think I have a tendency to do that I don't know about you but sometimes I lead my life and I look back to see the Lord's following and blessing me. And um, <clears throat> I have all these ideas and I sometimes even forget to ask him about them. But I think Worsby, I like Worsby, he says this, too many sincere people have tried to do God's work their own way and then have asked God to bless it. But ministry doesn't work that, that way. First, we find out what God wants us to do and we do it to glorify him. If we obey his will and seek to honor his name, he will come and bless the work with his powerful presence. And that's something that the Lord is continually working in my life, to seek him, to let him lead me, and not for me to envision something and ask the Lord to come along and bless my work instead of me to follow him. So um, I, I never, ever sewed up anybody with a horsetail. But I did one time So one of my daughter's lips up with a real suture. And um, after we were in this first place where I directed this clinic, albeit a little bit poorly, I never considered myself a great director, only delivered one baby there, and that was a little Down syndrome baby that I kept up with many years, the child of a pastor. So then we moved to our second location, and they were there for longer, at least eight years, and of all the strange places the Lord led me, he led me to work in a prison, and 98% of my patients were men, and I'm a gynecologist. And they didn't care, and they didn't know. <clears throat> and um, I, I loved that work. And it, I should remind myself and you that even though I'm doing things outside of what I ever envisioned, I was very happy. I truly loved working in that prison. And most of the people were very, without exception, they were poor. And their conditions were poor. And they slept on the floor. They ate very little. and if you recall, there are, Africa has the most populations of AIDS patient anywhere on the planet. And so a lot of them found their way into my prison. And so you can imagine men with AIDS without medical care. So I had the privilege of caring for them and I truly loved it. It wasn't a burden, it was fun. And so, <clears throat> And in fact, I would love to tell you about one of my favorite helpers in the prison who was condemned to death, but he was never killed, and nor he will be. I think he's out now. <laughs> and um, he obviously was in there for murder, but he was Muslim. And he became one of my best helpers. And that thunder right there reminds me, one time he looked at me and he said, um, Mama Carol, they would call me Mama Carol. <clears throat> Sorry, giving me some water. <clears throat> I had to send that back to him. He said, if there were a lightning bolt, I would get between you and the lightning. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he was Muslim to my knowledge. I don't know if he's saved yet, but the Lord gave me such a love for them and them a love for me that I just hope that I was 
could be the hands of Christ touching these people, and that's how I viewed it. And so the Lord changed some of my dreams, but he entrusted me with really special opportunities. And I saw these people as like treasures in the darkness because they really were in dark places. So we were there for about eight years, and then the Lord moved us to a third place. And by now, I have five children. And in this third place, um, we were not so far away from a mission hospital. But during the time before I became involved in that mission hospital, I had visited it. It's the same place I gave those instruments to. And this, I want to tie a little bit back to another prayer and a thought and a dream. Well, I was there, and I was there twice. And of the two times I was there, I worked both times with colleagues who were doing OBGYN. They were friends, they were women, but they were doctors. It's interesting because Christine reminded me she was there one of the times I was there. I had forgotten that she was there with me. But um, at the, during that visit, I remember doing C-section and treating twins and resuscitating a twin. And I walked up into the mountains that were beautiful behind that hospital. And I remember thinking, Lord, this is just amazing. And I started, this is not a, a spiritual dream. It was a daydream. And I was thinking, it would be so neat to be at this hospital to do OBGYN again. And I I made myself the hero of this daydream, which I tend to do anyway. <laughs> and, you know, I would help save the babies in distress. I would do emergency C-sections and all this cool stuff. And it honestly had nothing to do with thinking, oh, then I could share the gospel with them. I, didn't, I was just thinking about how much I would love to do that. And as I thought about that, I don't even think I was reading in the uh, Old Testament. And I didn't hear this audibly, but sometimes this happens to me. This verse came into my mind, and, and it's out of Jeremiah. And he's speaking, the Lord is speaking to Baruch, not Jeremiah. And he said, seek ye great things to yourself, for yourself, seek them not. And I thought, that is what I was doing. I was seeking great things for myself. So I went back, I left that hospital, and then I went back home, and I was with my son now. This was my fourth child, Lydia's the fifth. And um, I remember him sitting beside me when I got home, and I was still kind of reeling from this amazing experience. And he leaned over to me, and he said, Mama, you are the best doctor. And I thought, because you can get cramps out of my legs. <laughs> and uh, it just reoriented me to the fact that a lot of the denials of the Lord to us is because he knows us better than we do. And I can tell you, if I had been close to the hospital when my kids were growing up, they would have suffered because I am so pulled like a magnet to medical care. I'm sure I would have un I would have neglected them, not, not meaning to, but I would have had always a reason to rush to the hospital, always. And, he, and the Lord, I think, relieved me from that conflict by keeping me away from something that would pull that hard on me. So then we moved to the fourth location. And the other thing I want to tell you before I explain that is when Christine and I were at that hospital, and then when I was there with my other friend who was OBGYN, somebody in the hospital died. That's, of course, not unusual. But in Africa, people lament death in a very, very expressive way and particularly audibly so they truly wail and if you've ever heard people wailing over someone's death it, it just is painful to hear it pierces your soul you just it's like some of their grief enters you and it it's it's a little bit overwhelming really and so I heard that death well and it seemed to me to come from the pediatric ward and I remember telling the Lord at that time saying, Lord, if there's any way I can ever enter into that suffering in that kind of hospital setting again, please let me back in. And I just knew it was a prayer. I wasn't making him let me do that, but I just felt like that. He would understand that. I felt their affliction and I knew he did and that he's a God of afflicted people and that he would potentially honor that prayer, but I didn't have any idea how. So then, we moved to a third location, and I was a lot closer to that hospital. Now, this is really how the Lord works. It's so strange. I got all this time, even though I had been working with men, um, I didn't even tell you, but 
Uh, in addition to the prison, I would go into the African bush or we'd drive into the bush. Christine would accompany us too because we needed help from not just medical people. Or I had I was either in the bush or I was in um, a prison. But the vast majority of my patients were men or children. And yet I had maintained my board certification from America in the field of OBGYN. And I got a letter, the strangest thing, every OBGYN in America got this letter that at least 80% of your patients had to be women. Well, I don't know why on earth that letter ever went out because how many typical American OBGYNs are treating men? And it's like, I, don't, I still don't know the origin of that letter. But I felt like the Lord was saying, it's time to put your Isaac on the altar because I had almost, I had treasured my certification and the training I had done in OBGYN and I, I thought I'm just gonna have I can't honestly how can I talk I, I don't 80 percent of my patients are men and this is a new rule so I remember telling Walter and I was really upset telling him that you know I think that the Lord's just brought me to the point where OBGYN will never be part of my my missionary experience and um he said you know you have always contoured your ministry around mine which was that's normal right he's the leader and i would want to but he said well what can we do to make this happen for you and i said well i would have to be in a hospital where there is OBGYN, and i would have to retrain myself because it's 15 years since i've done surgery and he said well let's do it and it would be i don't want to take up the rest of time explaining how that happened but it was possible for us to drive from our house and spend time at that hospital for like a week or two at a time and I would take the kids that were with us and they do homeschool up there so they didn't lose anything and Walter didn't mind so we worked out this thing where I would periodically go and then the Lord sent these amazing American OBGYNs at the right place at the right time to re-give me my skills and so I spent really a couple months with them before they left and I was back my, myself in that role but in this particular hospital we always operated with other surgeons so I was never completely alone and I I truly did love it but one thing the Lord did for me that was so sweet and unexpected is that I had a case in front of me and I was going to do it with a resident surgeon they're like surgeons in training and this nurse came out to talk to me before we started and she says Dr. Carroll I said, yes. She says, would you like to use your hysterectomy set? I had completely forgotten that I had given that set to this hospital. And I felt like the Lord said, I don't forget. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and in addition to that, you know, he is letting me be back in a hospital where I am doing emergency C-sections. I am resuscitating babies. And, you know, I remember going up to the mountain behind the hospital, the same place where I had this heroic daydream. And telling the Lord, Lord, you gave it all back. You gave me everything I ever thought to use back. And this was like years had gone by. I didn't, maybe 20 years since my training that I, and so I just thought, I think the Lord did not have to do that. But he did that. And so that's what I'm talking about, about how the Lord often, he gives us the desires and he realizes them, but in his own way. But that was just such a, a monumental moment in my life. Like not one single thing had I given the Lord that he didn't give right back to me in such a beautiful and amazing way. And so um, I wanted to share that. And another thing I wanted to share is that, um, well, sometimes the Lord lets us put what we think are our Isaacs on the altar, but he does give them back in ways that we don't expect and then that's all about Africa right but we're in France now we've been there for four years so it'd be funny for you to walk out of the room and all I told you about Africa but because I did love it so much it was hard for me to leave and go to France but clearly the Lord was leading us to France through a lot of series of events and that mostly was security we had a lot of traumatic situations that were very insecure and we didn't feel safe staying there nor with our two children Lydia and her brother and so after really searching the Lord's will he led us to France but this is back to me praying and thinking about 
my dreams and I remember this very vividly. I was jogging and praying and I thought, I can't not do OBGYN in France. I knew I couldn't. It, there, Europe, no country in Europe recognizes an American license of any sort in medicine. There might be other things, but not in medicine. So you can't be a doctor here and go act like a doctor there. You just can't. So I was just thinking, what on earth am I going to do? I did have intentions to go back and forth to Africa, but I wasn't sure how I could really be involved with that ministry that I love serving afflicted people. And so I literally was jogging and I was, I asked the Lord in a, in a audible prayer in, in my head, audible, but Lord, what about my dreams? I said, you know, I've always, I mean, uh, how, how does this work with doing OBGYN and all my dreams? And it was so strange. It was again one of those moments as if the Lord said, well, can't you embrace the dreams of others? And where we went in France, there was a couple who was 70 years old. She had battled cancer. She'd had chemo in the whole works. They had an older Down syndrome son that was completely dependent on them, living with them. And they had been in the ministry for 40 years and we were gonna take the ministry over for them so their ministry could continue. And it was a Bible Institute and a church. So it was a very valuable ministry. And they had been praying for help. They had been praying that someone would come take their work so it wouldn't fold. And we were the answer to their prayer. And so, you know, I, I thought about that. It was a little selfish for me to insist that the Lord realize my dreams and plans when they their plans were just as important, if not more so. Mine were a little selfishly oriented again. And so that really helped me. And then back to the idea that you really can't outgive the Lord is that since we've been Africa in Africa, he has allowed me to go back many times into West Africa, into East Africa, Zambia, Togo, Benin. I'm looking forward to going to the West Bank in March, to Togo potentially in November. So I get to go a lot of neat places and also, I love the ministry in France. You know, the Lord knows how he created us. And one thing I did is when I was jogging down another trail, I said, Lord, I know that you hear the cry of the afflicted, but I can't find them here. And I, I know they are hurting afflicted people, but they're all behind closed doors. They, and I, I don't know, would you please show me where they are? And then do a really, it really is a miracle. I was praying for over a year about possibly working with prostitutes. I could not find a road in. I called numbers, I pursued it. I mapped out where they were. It's by the way, it's illegal in France. So it's legal in Luxembourg. We live near Luxembourg, but it's legal only in a two mile radius. So you can find them easily and only legal after dark. So I had mapped it out. I had read everything I could find. I just can not figure out how. And naturally I couldn't take Walter into that mess. So um, I met with this girl every now and then about my age and we would pray together and she said, what's your prayer request? And I said, I really would love to figure out how to reach, I need a ministry that I can be around needy people. That's all I said, I didn't say, and she said, oh, I don't know, but she said, I have a friend who works with prostitutes, would that interest you? I couldn't believe it. So that phone call led me into a group that their primary goal is the gospel. And after that, helping these women out of that trade. And so the Lord opened a very unexpected ministry in France that I loved. Most of them, many, many were trafficked into it. And the majority of the prostitutes come from West Africa. So it's like he brought Africa to me in a very neat setting. And so I, I just, I really want to thank the Lord for all those type of things that he's done for me and just sometimes he has to pull very hard on my reins because I'm very strong willed and Lydia will tell you that he get me in the car and if I think we need to go right we go right and um, so anyway he has rerouted me so many times but realized my own dreams in his better way and maybe you're thinking what does that have to do with lavender and I do want to finish on time um, but I was, I had planned in France when we got a, a place that we could stay, France is really well known for lavender and I love lavender. 
and that my little dream was that I was going to intentionally plant myself a plot of lavender.